Hi everybody, you having a good day so far? Yeah. Yeah. Excellent, yeah. excellent. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about um, really blockchain from the perspective of the Grinch. So I'm going to be your blockchain, blockchain Grinch for today. But maybe you have a little bit of that already. I'm going to kind of pile it on with a few extra layers. So we'll see how that goes. We'll see how that goes. Um, I'm going to structure this in three parts. So the first part, I'm going to go on an app safari. We're going to have a little bit of a look at the kinds of things that people are actually doing with this. So, so far we've been talking about kind of very high level abstract principles. We've been talking about possible use cases. <coughs> what really are people doing with this? Um, I'm going to take a look at some uh, tar pits and bear traps. What could go wrong? and what would you do about it and then i'd like to encourage you perhaps more than anything to think about um actually what could what could something that's new and maybe seems a little bit magical and special actually give us the potential to do that we've maybe we've always wanted to do but we've kind of felt constrained by institutional processes and inertia and resistance to change what could, um, and if you're familiar with Alfred Hitchcock's movies, the concept of the, the MacGuffin, a plot device that moves everything along. What if we treated blockchain as a MacGuffin and just said, oh, actually, you know, I don't really need to know what this is. It could be magic for all that, for all that matters, but it lets us move on. So those are, those are my three bits for today. We'll see how that goes. Let's, let's go on an app safari to begin with. I should say, I've, as a recurring motif, I've used a bit of um, graffiti, graffiti art, which I'm a big fan of. The graffiti art thing, particularly, I think is relevant to blockchain because it's in that kind of space of, of being a little bit wild, a little bit uncontained. It's out there, it's in the public domain, but it's not regulated, it's not controlled. A bit like what we see with, with graffiti art. That's my, that's my pretext for including it anyway. I like the pictures. Um, so we, we talked a little bit already about provenance, and I think that's really interesting from perspective, for example, if you're from a research library, if you work in academia, there's an awful lot of conversations about, well, how do we know who's reproducing this study? How, how do we know who's tried and failed to reproduce this study? Wouldn't it be great if there's just a place that you could go that had all of the citations for this piece of work, all of the attempts to reproduce uh, a series of experiments? Wouldn't that be brilliant? And in the uh, commercial blockchain space, there's quite a few of these projects which are more typically they're looking at provenance in a kind of retail sense. So. You know, if I buy some fair trade uh, chocolate or coffee beans or something, can I be confident that there's no child labor being involved, for instance? Things like that. So a lot of these projects and startups, uh, provenance.org has had an awful lot of airtime. That's a very interesting example of what people are doing with this stuff. And uh, various art, so you think about um, everything from coffee beans and chocolate up to, if I'm paying a shitload of money for what I think is a genuine painting, uh, not, a, not a forgery, actually could we use some of these technologies to help us be completely sure we're getting what we think we're getting? And if you're uh, talking about high value artwork, then that's particularly interesting because you really pay quite a lot of money at auction for something that maybe you think is a genuine Banksy. Maybe it shreds itself during the auction as well, just for fun. But I was talking about fair trade. The particular reason for that is, I think it's quite interesting to go to, to, go to the experts, to go to the people who have the most uh, stake, the most interest in a, a subject area. So go back to those coffee beans and go back to that chocolate. What do the, the fair trade people say about this? Well, we'll share these slides so you can you can read the small print. But they say, well, you know, we're not really sure what problem this is solving. There's a lot of people doing really interesting things with technology around provenance, and blockchain isn't the only thing. 
But really the people who are most affected by fair trade, they're subsistence farmers, they have nothing. And the idea that you can teleport in all this technology, which might as well have come from another planet, doesn't really address the problems that they face day to day. And, and also, fundamentally, how do we know if it's true? We heard already that you can put all sorts of stuff on the blockchain and can be checked for uh, interference. So you can check that someone's tampered with the blockchain. What if the data that goes in isn't actually reliable in the first place? What if someone says, yeah, of course it's, of course there's no child labor in fault. <laughs> Never do a thing like that. <laughs> never. We don't necessarily know that. All we know is that they've made that assertion. And that's quite a crucial thing. So, what, what else? Well, identity is very interesting. We, we heard a little bit already about self-sovereign identity. The idea that we could have digital identities that weren't owned and controlled by employers, um, tech conglomerates, the so-called FANG companies like Facebook, um, Amazon, Google. Wouldn't it be great if you could own and control your own digital identity? And this particular company here, Sovereign, did some very interesting work in this area because they've essentially established a coalition of the willing around this. So they've said, who's, who's really exercised about this? And yeah, okay, some governments are, some banks are, credit card companies, uh, educational institutions. A lot of people who are big stakeholders in identities working. So I think this, this one is a very interesting one to watch. Um, they're trying to build an open standard, open framework that people can plug into and that everybody contributes to. If you're a big stakeholder, you run a chunk of this infrastructure, but you don't own it. Exclusively. The only problem is, yeah, <laughs> as with so much of this, well, but then there's these guys, and oh, there's these guys. And the concept that we have that, you know, perhaps we might own and control our own digital identity. <sighs> Which one? <laughs> Which one, and there are others, these are just the tip of the iceberg. Which one of these should we go with? And if we're an organization of one of you, your uh, university or council, wherever you're coming from, your research institute, so they're thinking, hmm, we should really check this out, we should really get involved. It's very hard to know which of these, and as I say, tip of the iceberg, there are a lot more of these, which one of these should I get involved with? Which one could I maybe do some kind of pilot with? So I thought it was interesting to look at what the Government Digital Service had to say. In a similar vein to looking at the uh, Fair Trade view, what does GDS have to say? So this is a post, a blog post from the technical architect of something called Gov.uk Verify, which is the kind of national digital identity service for government services. And he kind of says, well, the problem is, actually, identity isn't a problem. We've got lots of working, effective identity systems for the internet already. You use them every day. You might not like it that, I don't know, you're logging in with your Facebook identity all the time, but it's there, it works. Billions of people use it every day. And a lot of what's being sold here is really quite untested, experimental, and ultimately, um, what happens if it stops working? You become quite reliant upon it. I'll come back to that in a moment. So there's a, kind of a few interesting questions just going on this app safari, and kind of thinking, well, maybe, maybe some of this stuff isn't quite ready for, for prime time yet. Uh, and I've spent a lot of time working in higher education. I've noticed that uh, I've been very interested in getting credentials digitalized. So I get a degree from somewhere, maybe I become a climate refugee. Maybe I have to flee a war-torn uh, conflict zone, somewhere like Syria. I turn up in the UK, nobody knows I'm a brain surgeon. How do I prove it to them? How do I prove it to them? Or do I have to go back to college? Do 
learned to spend years relearning everything just so that I can get that bit of paper that says this guy knows what he's talking about. You could let him operate on your brain. Um, wouldn't it be great if there was some way that we could just issue these persistent digital credentials that would survive, let's say, my university where I got that degree being blown up by ISIS? Wouldn't it be great if there was some way that we could do that? And that information would be persistent. It wouldn't be uh, beholden to any one organization. And I wouldn't have to have that little bit of paper that I carry around, which is as precious as a passport. So it's great. Again, there are a lot of companies trying things in this space. So uh, Learning Machine here, which pretty much kicked it off in a project with MIT, they've just been acquired. So it'll be interesting to see how that works out. They built a bunch of technology, got a bunch of people using it. Uh, what will the folk who just acquired that company want to do with it? Where will they want to take it? What will they fundamentally, what will they want to do with data which that company holds? Very interesting questions. Um, but again, well, they're not the only ones. So Learning Machine is based in the States. Here's a UK company, GradBase. Uh, and, oh, here's another UK company, a, a Credible. There are all the people who want to do this. Is there just one? And again, really interesting to think about this from a kind of long-term perspective. Who ultimately should own and control that kind of information, the information that says, you know, this guy is, is a neurosurgeon? Well, whose responsibility should that be? And you know we're sat here today in in the Chartered Institute for Librarians and Information Professionals. Does it feel like things like Chartered Institutes should own and control this? Does it feel like the state should own and control it, or does it feel like a private company should? It's really interesting questions to think about. Um, let's go to uh, a colleague of mine, David Kernahan who has some very interesting things to say about this. Um, most of all, the how plays down a really interesting question of why. Why do we actually want to do any of this? And what you'll hear in a lot of the conversations about blockchain is a kind of breathless hype. This is amazing, it's incredible, it's, it's changed everything, it's transformational. And I think we need to be very careful about that. There's a little bit of a, a cult of personality that you sometimes see. That's a little bit, if I dare I use the word Brexit here today, it's a little bit like, you know, we want to believe. And a lot of people were sold Brexit in terms of a, a, a vision. It was never really even articulated. And we see some similar things, I think, with, with a lot of the hype around blockchain. So, so that was a little bit of an app safari. What about those tar pits and bear traps? What, what could go wrong? And my favorite right now, I don't know, has anyone listened to this, Jamie Bartlett? So the, yeah, The Missing Crypto Queen, absolutely fascinating series of, of podcasts. Do, do check it out on, on BBC Sounds. Um, one of many examples of people who've, who've come along, who've been really charismatic, who've got that incredible, power of persuasion to persuade people to sign up to their project, hand over their money. Uh, another example here, IDAX Global, a cryptocurrency exchange where the CEO, like the missing crypto queen in Jamie Bartlett's series, the CEO's just kind of vanished and wouldn't you know it, the key to unlock all the cryptocurrency wallets vanished with them. Um, a little bit, a little bit um, disappointing. Oh, oh, and here's another one. So, this guy, this is even more mysterious. This guy apparently committed suicide. Again, you know, the, the keys to the cryptocurrency wallets. Uh, we don't know where they are. They may be lost forever. You may never have access to your your money again. But. There's, there's a growing amount of evidence that actually he may have faked it. 
So we're actually at the point where people are talking about exhuming his body for DNA testing so we can confirm or disprove whether it's really him. So this is the world that we're living in, in terms of uh, blockchain hype, particularly around cryptocurrencies. A lot of these uh, charismatic individuals who've uh, put on a real dog and pony show to persuade a whole load of people to sign up to their project. I think we need to be very careful. Um, if someone comes along and, and does something like that to one of us, if someone uh, tries to bring us into their project, I think we have to be quite, there I say it, we have to be quite cynical. So this is good, good for British people because it's something we excel at. So you've got to be quite cynical and say, look, what's the real story here? Where is this really going? Um, I have a bunch of questions. I don't. I don't have many bullet points on these slides, so there's there's only a couple more that have bullet points. But some real questions, like if if this if this goes wrong, actually, what what control do I have? Do I even have a copy of my data? A lot of these. Um, services are built on top of cloud resources like Amazon Web Services where you pay by the month for the resources that you use. So if you can't pay, what happens? It goes away. It's all gone. So if you're dealing as a, as a library, as a, a university, as a council, if you're dealing with a very small company which has maybe just got cash flow problems for a month or two, you might not be able to afford to keep the lights on. And this is something that most of us aren't particularly familiar with, unless you've worked with startups already. This is quite uncharted territory. But do you even have a copy of your data? The whole point about blockchain is that if you do it right, it's distributed, you can have it smeared across the internet so that if there's problems, oh, it's okay, because we've got 100 copies of this. It's smeared all over the internet. Or is it, as we heard earlier on, is it entirely within the purview of one company, perhaps even controlled by one person, like those charismatic CEOs who took their cryptocurrency keys to the grave with them? Um, if not, why not? And I think these are the kind of questions that informed customers or uh, collaborators on, on projects should be asking. Do you hold a copy of the code if that product is something from a very small company, you may be able to persuade them to sign an escrow agreement so that you can run a copy of it if the company falls, or you can acquire their assets, for example. I know it sounds a little bit doom laden, but actually these small companies and startups, most of them will fail. Of those <coughs> screenshots that I showed earlier on, most of those companies won't be around, let's say, three to five years from now. So this is quite sobering stuff. But also, when we talked about permission on the blockchain, the original concept dating back to when Bitcoin came along was that essentially a public blockchain was something anybody could scribble on. And let's go back to the example of academic credentials. Do you really want anybody to be able to scribble on someone else's record to say, oh yeah, yeah, um, they were struck off, actually. You know, yeah, they might have, they might have got a qualification as a neurosurgeon, but now in malpractice, they were struck off. And if it's immutable, if it's permanent, as we just heard, what happens to that? If someone scribbles on your record to say he's a wrong gun, do you do you put a little addendum to it saying no, I'm not? And who attests to the fact that you are actually who you say you are? that you do have those qualifications and actually you weren't struck, up, struck off from malpractice. So a lot of, lot of interesting questions there. I mean, I could go on for, for hours about this, but really, really interesting questions around GDPR. So um, subject access requests, how does that work? And what about the right to, to be forgotten? So the, the right to be forgotten, well, this is a permanent indelible database. So what do we do? Do we add a little flag to it that says, actually this person would rather this particular thing was forgotten so please pretend that you didn't see it that doesn't feel quite right um, and this diagram here i think nicely crystallizes the complexity this is a diagram uh, ibm produced so a reference architecture 
for blockchain projects. You don't need to worry about what's on it, actually, apart from this little circle here. This is the blockchain. <coughs> and what IBM has said is essentially, let, let's imagine that we're creating, we're creating a new thing, a new digital product or service. Um, over here, that's you, you're the user. And maybe you've got a phone, or you've got a web browser or whatever that you use to access this. In this big box is all the stuff that you are going to have anyway. You're going to have it anyway because it's unavoidable. It's things like load balancers, it's database servers, it's web services. It's just all the stuff that you need to build a modern, modern day app. And here's the blockchain bit. And, and what's crucial about this is this is extra. It doesn't replace any of this. It's extra. And by the way, nobody really understands it. Only a handful of people. It's sort of weird and new and magical and experimental. And you need all of this, and we're going to tack this new magical stuff on as well. So be very careful. Be very careful. Because if you don't really understand this, then you just add a huge extra layer of risk and complexity to the thing that you wanted to do. And by the way, this bit down here is a database. And I think you really have to ask yourself, you know, this database is probably quite good at, what, I don't know, storing things, searching for things. It's probably quite fast, it's probably quite flexible. This is like a very big, slow database that has quite a limited set of features. If I've got one of these already, do I really need this bit? Has it got some unique characteristics which will make this whole thing better and make it more powerful, more effective? So, how are we doing? Ah, good, good. So, blockchain McGuffin. What about, <laughs> what about the, the concept that we could use blockchain not actually necessarily as a technology, as a, as a standard product or anything like that. Just use it as a thought experiment to think differently about how we do things. So I don't know, does anybody recognize this? You know what this is, I'm sure quite a few of you. Anyone want to say it? Rosebud. Rosebud, yes. So um, we think about the MacGuffin in Particularly in Alfred Hitchcock's uh, films, there was often an object, like the statuette in Maltese Falcon, an object which it turned out had no real purpose other than to move the plot along. And that, you know, the Maltese Falcon, the, the statue, well, the Rosebud in Citizen Kane <coughs> didn't really have any intrinsic value or purpose, it was just there to move the plot along. So, what, what if we think about blockchain the same way. Um, what would we like to do that we can't do now because, oh, you know, it's just the way we've always done things. Um, you'll need to set up a project board. Um, is it written into the strategy, the five-year plan, and the implementation plan? And has it been seen by all of the necessary project boards and governance bodies? And all of that stuff that stops us from experimenting and innovating. Um, there is a danger, of course, if we actually talk about really using blockchain in this way, then someone might call our bluff and say, okay, let's do it. And suddenly you find yourself chained to a monster, potentially. So be very careful, be very careful. But I think it's really interesting to consider a bit like the, um, the so-called desire lines, you know, we built a path, let's imagine this is corporate IT, we built a path, everyone has a standard PC with all the standard software and it's all laboriously installed and managed and maintained. Everyone goes off and, you know, well, I've got me an iPad actually, and I found these apps that do what I want, so I'm just going to, I'm just going to ignore this thing which you spend a huge amount of time and energy and, and actually money on. I'm going to go this way because this suits me more. This happens all the time, particularly in, in IT. Maybe we can use that, that blockchain MacGuffin to open up a little bit of uh, a license to innovate, let's call it. But at the same time, I think we need to be very clear 
well, what our risk appetite is, what kind of risks are we are we prepared to take, what, what kind of risks are we allowed to take, when we look at things like uh, uh, qualifications, when we look at things like identities, there are huge risks if you screw it up. And what is the opportunity cost? We might like to do something new and different, but that doesn't happen for free. It takes people's time, it takes people's energy, and it can cost a fair bit of money as well. So where, where could we go? What could we do next? Well, specifically in, in blockchain circles, there are lots of these kinds of sites, and you may have seen some of them already. Other people are trying to build manifestos we're using blockchain in things like uh, research, things like we talked about education, we talked about uh, accrediting qualifications and things like that. Um, blockchain specifically for information professionals, there's a nice uh, blog here that we'll, we'll send a link out to from an American uh, university team, really trying to drill down to some of those use cases and say well, what, what actually actually could we do? So there's a lot of interest, I've seen a lot of interest. Um, we could say that there's areas of promise, but remember identity, qualifications, things like that, these are heavily regulated. Um, even if you think you've got an interesting project, an interesting idea, you might find that you need someone's permission to really progress with it. Let's say you wanted to award degrees uh, that are backed by a blockchain uh, system, actually your institution needs to be okay with that. It's not something that you need to go, you can just go away and do. And then you're back into that world of five-year plans and strategies. Um, real parallels with the early web, particularly in the sense that there are an awful lot of hustlers in the dot-com era selling unimaginable and unachievable dreams. And, We've seen quite a bit of that in the blockchain space. A lot of people who are 99% uh, hype, let's say. And one thing that's particularly uh, important to watch out for is people using a uh, kind of techno babble, using jargon. Because, you know, Byzantine fault tolerance is, you know, super important. What do you mean you don't know what that is? <laughs> it's, you know, I'll explain it to you one day. Um, that, that whole point um, of people using techno babble to uh, try and pull the wool over your ears, be, be very wary of that. And most of all, I'd say be wary of geeks bearing grifts. There are an awful lot of those about. I was quite pleased when I came. <laughs> Beware of geeks bearing grifts because there, there are too many of them out there. And I think. I'll, I'll close with this wonderful line from Jimmy Wales, the Wikipedia founder. Someone <coughs> engaged him on Twitter, and, and they're like, Jimmy, Jimmy, Wikipedia, put it on the blockchain. It'll be the best thing ever. It'll be incredible. And, and Jimmy, I have to hand it to the guy, because he doesn't need to do this. He, he just had this quite calm, measured conversation with him, where he essentially said, yeah, but why? Why? And they said Byzantine fault tolerance, permissionless, oh, distributed. Yeah, okay, but why? Um, what it got down to was they, they didn't really give him a compelling reason why he should put Wikipedia on blockchain. And we ended up with this, this wonderful line from Jimmy, we already store data in a database, works well. And this isn't true for everything. It's not true for every database. It's not true for every use case. And there are all these interesting corner, corner cases and questions like Craig talked about, where you have a bunch of people who have to work together, but they don't trust each other. It sounds a bit like academia, actually. Um, maybe there is something there. Maybe there is something there. And it might not be the blockchain that we think of right now. It might be, not be the technology that Rob and Jonathan introduced at the beginning of the day, it might end up being something quite different, but you've got to get used to the fact we'll probably call it blockchain in much the same way that a lot of the things that we, the terms that we use now, don't mean nearly what they started off being, like hacker, which is my personal book there. Um, but that's been me, so thank you very much. Um, 
Do you catch me late for the questions?